It is time for Around the 412 with Smitty and Tyler. Welcome back to another episode of Around the 412. I am Tyler. With me, as always, is my co-host, Smitty. Be sure to go follow us on all of our social medias at Around the 412 and wherever you're listening to this podcast. And if you're not on a listening platform, go subscribe to our YouTube, hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. While you're there at, on the YouTube or the listening platforms, you can check out the links that we have in the descriptions of each of these shows. And check out our first link is the Rocket Around the 412 Year 6 GoFundMe. You can click on that, read about the message. Over the first five years, we've raised over 25 Five thousand dollars for chill to help provide children Christmas in our local seven two four and four one two area codes, as well as last year partnering with the East Rochester PA Salvation Army and adopting kids off of their angel tree, um, so and providing Christmas for them as well. So you can go read about that message there, and then they also have the everything custom designs. Our friend Haley Wagner out of Manaka, uh, she does uh, custom uh, T shirts. I know we, she does uh, kitchen aprons, and in, it's almost October already, and Halloween is getting closer than you know it. So she also is doing some customized uh, trick-or-treat bags for those guys. No hats, though, still, um, but you can get some trick-or-treat bags for your kids or for yourself. So uh, go check out some of those links in the description. No hats. Actually, we were just talking about it right before we started recording that you didn't even know that your mom just got some shirts off of no, her. I had I saw no them. clue. I saw them. I shared... Um, she just did these actually pretty cool ones. I, I don't know if she got them in gold or if they were only in gold, but it was like an outline of the state of Pennsylvania. And then there's like a little heart where like we are like Pittsburgh. So, um, yeah, she apparently got those shirts off of Haley and you didn't know that, but I saw them talking on the post. So I figured she was going to order them and then, yeah, yeah. So hopefully, uh, everything goes well there. The exchange goes well. And your mom has some shirts now from Haley, who we talked about on the show, uh, Bonnie, I know you're not listening to this because otherwise you would have known that we knew who Haley was. <laughs> you would have known so. that we uh, we advertise yeah. everything custom yeah. designs. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Um, but yeah, so this is the Steelers show. As you guys have seen now, we've been doing it. How many weeks has it been since we started breaking up like this? Over a month. Pretty probably, much a month, that, probably. Yeah. Um, we've been breaking the show up. So this is the Steelers show. Um, we'll put out the Penguins and Pirates show throughout the week as well. Really enjoyed doing it this way. I think it breaks it up nicely. Uh, the Steelers, speaking of doing things nicely, two and one now on the season. They did a big win on Sunday Night Football over the Las Vegas Raiders. Actually, the first thing I want to talk about here doesn't even involve the game itself. I don't know that I expected. I mean, we know the Steelers fans travel well, and like every stadium they go into, we're going to be like a noticeable presence. I'll be honest. I didn't expect that, though, for the Raiders in their home opener, like six hundred plus dollars a ticket. That's a good fan base in itself. I didn't expect it to be 60 percent. They're saying about 60 percent of it was Steelers fans. They like really showed out for this one. What, what was your like impression of that? Did you expect that? And why do you think it is? Is it fans that are actually located in the Vegas area or is it people like when the schedule came out, they were circling it because it is like a destination game? I think you're going to get a little bit of both. Um, Vegas is always going to be one of those spots where if there's a game there, it is an easy destination uh, for, for fans to want to travel to because there's all the stuff that you can do while you're in Vegas as well as going to the game. So I'm sure there was a ton of people, not just from Pittsburgh, but all around the country that were Steeler fans that circled this one and said, I want to go to that game, especially when you add on the the historical rivalry sense of the Steelers mm -hmm. and the Raiders. I'm sure the older part of the fan base uh, no offense, has a little more to do with that than we do. But I, also, I feel like there are some, because in Vegas itself, because Steeler Nation is no joke. I mean, I've, I've lived in, I live in Oklahoma now. I lived in Utah um, in the previous like year and a half before this. And I, I've been around the country quite a bit. And I've seen like Steeler Nation is no joke. And it's not just Vegas where this has happened. Obviously, to the scale, it's not always like this, where <laughs> over 50% of the stadium is this the Steelers except even when they're the away team but we've seen them dominate some of the the places they've gone to anytime they play any of the LA teams um if they, play, the West Coast. If, if they play in Arizona um if, if they play in Jacksonville I mean there are several places where you see Steeler fans dominate in in the even if it's not over 50 percent but still if, if I feel like if you have 20 to 30 percent plus in your stadium of away fans then that is a win for the away team and the away fan base so to see how much and it's fu funny enough i actually got a text from my aunt amy 
who was traveling to Vegas, not for the Steeler game. I mean, she, she's a Chiefs fan. They live in there. Actually, they lived in Kansas City. Now they moved to Austin, Texas. But um, she texted me and she said, I'm on a plane from Phoenix heading to Las Vegas and I'm stealing a lot of Steeler fans. And I, I just said, Steeler Nation is everywhere. And she's like, yeah, well, we saw a lot yesterday. So even my my aunt, like a day before the game, was seeing a lot of Steeler Nation traveling to this game. And it was very evident, not just on the broadcast, but I saw a lot of the videos and pictures that people were posting on Twitter, even the Steelers' social media is posting after the game. There were a ton of terrible towels, a ton of black and gold. It was a lot of fun to see, but I, I, I do think it was a combination of you have – one of the best franchises, uh, like fan bases, and it's the sense of traveling to these away games. But Vegas is Vegas, you're always going to get people to come to Vegas, it's an easy destination to go to. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned the person I buy my season tickets off of, they were there, it was their 65th birthday on Sunday, so and they spent like $700 a ticket to be there. Like, so yeah, that's crazy. I think- I think very similar to her, and you you said this as well, when the schedule came out in May, I feel like people were like, all right, week three, Sunday night football, we're at Vegas. That's the game I'm going to. Like, even if it's the only game I'm going to this year, that is the one. So, yeah, I think with it being like a destination game where people know like, hey, I'm going to make at least like a weekend, if not a whole week out of this trip, um, because there's so much to do there. I just think that made so much sense, uh, but I didn't expect that. I thought it would be, again, giving the Raiders credit for being a really good fan base in their own right. I thought we it, it would be like the other way, like 60 Raiders, 40 Steelers, and that would have been a pretty good split. I was very pleasantly surprised and very um, impressed with the turnout of Pittsburgh Steelers fans in this game. Um, let's talk about the game itself, though. Now, I, I think we're going to spend more time on the offense, so let's start with the defense. Coming into this game, the Raiders offense had not allowed a sack. And specifically on that right side, Jermaine Illuminor had not a lot of pressure. Uh, TJ Watt added two sacks to his already franchise record in this game, going against Illuminor, and had a pressure rate nearly 30% of his snaps. Um, so TJ Watt had his way with a, a really good right tackle. I mean, I don't know that Jermaine Illuminor certainly not a household name or anything like that. He was actually a free agent that the Raiders had to bring back. He's kind of moved around, but he's found a home now there in Vegas. Pretty solid right tackle. Um, but TJ Watt again had his way. And then, and then you look at what they did on the ground. I think that they executed their game plan. We'll talk about the Devonte Adams thing here in a little bit, because I want to bring up what he did too, but Josh Jacobs had a long of 10 in this game. Like they, mm-hmm. they bottled him up very nicely. I know that he wasn't putting up the type of numbers that he had last season in the first two weeks either, but I think as a whole, the Steelers executed their game plan. Again, we'll talk about the Devonte Adams thing, because we might actually have differing opinions on this, but how did you feel about the defense's performance of a whole? I don't know that we need to every week say, like, yeah, TJ Watt had two sacks again. He's clearly the best defensive player in football. But it, it was on display again on a national stage on Sunday Night Football. Yeah, before I talk about the defense as a whole, can do you think this, this is the best TJ we've seen? Is, is he playing at his peak level from what we've seen so far? I, it's hard to argue against it. And what I'll say is I don't know that he's had a better partner on the other side. Like all, all credit to, you know, Bud Dupree and the other players that have been even, even different versions of Alex Highsmith, this version of Alex Highsmith on the other side is why TJ Watt is at his best right now, because you have a legit threat. And even behind those guys, Marcus Golden and Nick Herbig as three and four. I mean, Marcus Golden had a really nice game on Sunday night too. Like uh, his, his chop move is as good as it gets. I, I think that it is the best version of TJ Watt because of the the supporting cast that he has behind him. I absolutely agree. I, I think that's a, a great combination of that duo that you have up front. And you mentioned that Marcus Gold and Nick Herbig. We haven't seen a ton of Nick Herbig when it comes to regular season, but we saw what he could do in the preseason. I thought Marcus Golden did well. He had a, had a sack in this game um, mm-hmm. against the Raiders. I think that that's probably uh, one of the best, if not the best, uh, first guy in on the, on the outside that you've had at that linebacker position while TJ's been it, it, it with the Steelers. I, I feel say, like, yeah, I mean like rookie 2020 where you had high Smith as a rookie as the third guy with, Bud as the starter, but I still, I think that again, this is four deep as opposed to three deep. And I, I, I think this is a little bit better. I think this is clearly the best pass rush group they've had in TJ's tenure. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Um, defense as a whole, I thought it was a pretty good performance. Um, so I, 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 I 
had some defensive keys to this game. I thought the linebackers did pretty well. That was my second point. I thought they were better positionally because I felt like over the first couple weeks, especially in the San Francisco game, and you saw it a little bit um, with with some specific players uh, in the in the second game as well. But I just felt like they had been out of position. It's not that they were necessarily like taking plays off or anything like that. It was just it seemed like they were just miscues firing, and it seemed like it was a lot of a lot more mentally uh, whether they were positionally right or positionally sound or not. I thought they did, they did well, and you mentioned Josh Jacobs being limited to what was it, 62 yards along of 10. That was actually another one of my keys because going into that game, and granted, a lot of it was was taken up on some some big chunk plays that were that were given up uh, against Jerome Ford and Christian McCaffrey. But the Steelers were dead last in the NFL in, in rushing yards per game against going into this game at 183 per game. And so that was one of my keys. Like, I know Josh Jacobs hadn't had the, the first two games that Raiders fans had hoped, especially coming off of being the NFL uh, rushing leader last year. But you have to still limit him because there is that threat. And with what we saw over the first couple of weeks, he could pop off at any moment. I thought the Steelers did a great job. I thought the front seven, especially that front line, did a great job in the interior in the run game, really bottling things up and shutting it down. I I, I wish that it wasn't uh, – it didn't get as close as it did in the end. Um, I'm not really going to fault the defense for that uh, all, all that much, I mean, but yeah. it, it is what it is. But overall, I thought it was a pretty good performance from the defense. Yeah, Um so much to touch on there. I, I do want to say with the linebackers, Cole Holcomb, I put this out there. I think he's had more splash within the last two games than we had from the entire group as a whole last year. Um, maybe even the last couple of years combined. Like that was the big thing is even the moments where like the linebacker play was like, okay, you were getting absolutely no splash. We've seen Cole Holcomb force a fumble last week, this week on that Jimmy G hospital ball. He absolutely textbook hit on Devontae Adams um, and he had a tackle for loss as well in this game like he's he's making plays uh, that we just haven't had at the second level of the defense so I, I really liked what I've seen from week one was horrible but it was for most guys it was awful but cer certainly yeah uh, week two and three have been a step in the right direction for sure and I think communication I'll keep harping on this I think it's been the biggest thing like I believe in the personnel that they have I just think they haven't played enough together because there's so much turnover on that defense yeah. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, and specifically talking about the interior linebackers, I mean, we we said it again. Mark Robinson was the only turnover from last year. All of your your guys that played significant snaps on the inside, they were gone. And actually, they yeah. played against one of them in Robert Spillane on on mm -hmm. Sunday night. Um, but yeah, so the, there was going to take some time for them to get at, up to game speed and get the the chemistry to be able to play together. I think you're starting to see that come together, especially Cole Holcomb. Like you said, I think he is is clearly what the Steelers were hoping they would get when they signed him in the offseason. Yeah, he looks how that that foot injury that hampered him. He's clearly healthy there. Um, Mark Robinson, you mentioned him. I just wanted to real quickly touch on it. Was He logged his first snaps on defense, played four snaps defensively. I'm not sure why that was. I don't know if it was like a because they thought this was the type of game to get his feet wet the way that the Raiders run their offense. Um, but we've seen the Landon Roberts continuously drop snaps. I mean, he only played 17 in this game, which was a 10 snap decrease from his previous low in the first two weeks. So uh, I don't know if they just felt like it was a matchup to you know, test the water with Mark Robinson or what that was. It was kind of weird to see him out there. But um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about and get your opinion on was Levi Wallace because he gave up uh, quite a bit in this game. I mean, Devontae Adams had 13 catches for 172 yards and two touchdowns. A lot of that was with Levi Wallace as the primary defender. Other than that big, like the long touchdown, though, I'll be honest, I didn't think Levi Wallace had a bad game. I thought he was doing what they wanted him to do. Like, I think if if you don't know what the Steelers are trying to do defensively and you see that box score, you're going to be like, oh, what, what you know, Levi Wallace, why is he, you know, you're going to have the people clamoring for JPJ. And obviously, like, I do think that he should see an increased role continuing going forward. But the thing with Levi Wallace to me is, again, I don't think he was that bad. I think he was doing what the Steelers were asking him to do, which was keep everything in front of him. Obviously, that one broken long touchdown play, that's the exception to how I felt about his game overall. Two picks as well in this game. But I don't feel like anything was, like, egregious. Like, I feel like he was 
taking care of his assignment. They want to give up. They want to have Jimmy G throwing the ball 44 times. They want to see him dropping back. They want him to nickel and dime because eventually they know with get eight turnovers so far through three weeks, eventually they're going to make a mistake. We're going to get to the quarterback. They're going to turn the football over. We're okay with you taking, you know, five to eight yards per play. Just keep everything in front of you and don't let them take the top off. So I actually thought Levi Wallace was just executing the game plan again, with the exception of that one long touchdown. Right. And I agree with that. Um, I think it, when you look at the scheme of what the Steelers are doing, you're dropping in a zone, you're not playing man. So you're not expecting him to be up on these, these receivers. And, and so what they're expecting to happen is like you were saying, keep everything in front of you. Don't give up the long ball, which they did the one time, but overall I thought they did a pretty good job of, of still containing most of everything in front of them and the way that the Steelers are going to operate with with that that front core that they have, you're basically hoping that nobody gets lost in the zone and that the front seven gets home or that the edge rushers get home on, on Jimmy G, get pressure on him, make him uncomfortable. That's what you're really hoping that this defensive scheme is going to do. I don't really think Levi Wallace has played that bad. I think a lot of people will look at the, the catches he's giving up or giving up necessarily – um, it, it's just because they're, he's giving them a cushion to play a soft zone and making sure he's not getting beat. If anything, Levi Wallace's worst play hasn't even come on like the, the passing attack, in my opinion. No, it was that Christian McCaffrey Morgan. touchdown. He, he he missed the tackle. He was the one with Ford, though, too. I mean, he didn't contain on the outside. He, yeah. he cheated. So he was really the guy on both those long run plays. Right, and, and if, if that's the case, then then – he needs to improve there, but as far as what they're doing in, in the passing attack, I, I feel like he's doing an okay job. I'd still like to see an increased role of Joey Porter Jr. I'd like to still get him see more of his feet wet, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I think Levi Wallace is doing bad, especially when in the grand scheme of things, you look at what the Steelers are trying to do. They're not so much focused on like their secondary playing man, playing up pressed on these guys and getting turnovers that way. They are more fo- more so focused on their defensive line being able to get in and get pressure and get to the quarterback. And that's whenever the offense is going to make mistakes. It's more so a bend don't break offense um, where we're going to let you drive down the field, just chip down the field little by little. Eventually you're going to mess up. Yeah, I, I think too. And this isn't me talking down to anybody because I'm talking about myself here too, up until like I'm able to go back and watch the game is, Anytime that P- that like a defensive back is the closest defender and they give up something, like on the surface, we have no clue what that guy's what the defensive back assignment was. Like we don't know what the Steelers on that play, how they're rolling their coverage, or if a defensive back's like supposed to be passing that off to an assignment, like you're mentioning in zone coverage. If you notice in this game a lot, there was help over top when Levi would be covering Devontae Adams, whether that was make a Fitzpa- was Mitch Fitzpatrick mostly, but there wasn't help with inside leverage. They were willing to give him that inside every single time. So yeah, I mean, Devontae Adams, who's one of the best in the game overall, but certainly as a route runner too, um, he's taking that inside every time. He was getting those quick slants and quick outs, and he was just, you know, he was doing what he wanted for sure, but he wasn't it was by design that they weren't allowing him to go over top. They were saying, okay, yeah, beat us inside and out, but you're not going to go over top of us. So again, I I think that this was, I know it's hard to look at the box score and see 13 catches, 172 yards and two touchdowns. I really think outside of one play, the Steelers executed their game plan against them. And I think you also have to look at it this way. And this brings me to what my first key to the Steelers defense was. It was the most obvious one, but the hardest one to do. Limit Devontae Adams as much as you can. I mean, the dude had 20 targets in this game. He could have had 200 yards, yeah. He's arguably the the best receiver in football still. So it it is a tall task to be able to do that. The Steelers' defensive keys from in my book went two for three. Devontae Adams, he had had himself a game. And I I think I might even said in the video, like his stat line going into this game was – 12 catches for 150 yards and a touchdown on the season in the first two weeks. And I said, like, he could do that in one game. We saw that against the Steelers. So mm-hmm. it's it's hard for me to say, like, I wish that they would have done better against Devontae Adams when you look at it with the perspective of, oh, this is arguably the best receiver in football. The Steelers still won. And the Steelers, Steelers overall defense still did good, even though they got burned a few times by arguably the best. I mean, he got 20 targets in this. He he got almost half of Jimmy. G's he was their offense. In this game. I mean, yeah. 
I mean, Jacoby Myers did have 12 targets, too. It was literally he those did. two. Yeah. I mean, Hunter Renfro only had two. He's only had, like, eight on the season. Like, He's I'm not sure quiet. what's going on with. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with that whole situation because there was trade talks involving him prior to. Maybe he's just not a McDaniels guy. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, but, uh, yeah. Oh, real quick before we flip to the offense, staying with the I just mentioned McDaniels. What did you think about that decision? You know, they're down eight. Um, they get a first down because of the Marvin Leal's leverage. And then the Steelers force them into another fourth down situation. And they opt to kick a field goal to make it a five point game, hoping to get the ball back. And while they did get the ball back, there was like 13 seconds and they had no timeouts. So really weird decision. I mean, the only th- if, if I were McDaniels in that situation, I don't know why you're kicking a field goal there if you're not going to try to onside kick it immediately after. Um, regardless, I still think they should have just gone for gone for it on fourth down because, in my opinion, you kick the field goal, sure, you make it a five-point game. You still have to score a touchdown regardless. Mm-hmm. Either way, you're, you're going to have to score a touchdown. The only difference is you wouldn't have to make the two-point conversion after. But I, and, and I think that's making it harder on yourself to have to go through another drive again when you're already driving it up to that point. I don't know. I, I don't agree with the decision. I, I don't really c- quite understand what McDaniels was thinking. I, I saw the explanation for it, but I still don't get it. I think you're better off just trying it and then and then hoping you get the ball back to get another try. To like get, a, get a stop. On, even if you don't get it on fourth down, hoping that you get the ball back in your defense gets like a three and out against the Steelers. And then you get another try for it to go down the field and score. Either way, you had to score another touchdown. It just didn't make sense. I'm not sure if he knew what the score was because he said something about they needed two possessions. Dude, you just had an eight-point possession the previous drive. Like, I I don't understand what – I don't get it. I really don't know what was going through his head. If you were going to kick a field goal, you should have just declined the penalty on Liao because there would have been more time on the clock if you were okay with the field goal being the result of that drive. So I, I don't know. I think that like, that's what Alan said is I think you could have somewhat justified it if you would have just kicked a field goal regardless, even with that leverage penalty. But I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he uh, had money on the game because Las Vegas was minus three. So maybe he's like, I'll kick a field goal now and then we'll get in field goal range again. And I'll kick another one and then we'll onside it to try to go for the win. But we're at least going to cover, which they didn't. No, I, uh, no. Um, okay. Switching to the offensive side of things here for the Steelers. Um, I want to get your opinion on some things, obviously from a play calling perspective, I really didn't think it was like all that different, but what I think like is the reason that we have to give a little bit of a cap tip to Canada is just the game plan in general. I thought they did some different things that we haven't seen. You know, they ran from shotgun. They used play action. They got Kenny out in the bootleg. They did things that like make sense for a Kenny Pickett offense, things that he excelled out at Pitt. And for a struggling quarterback, uh, I think it kind of makes sense to play to their strengths. I mean, in general, it kind of makes sense to do that. But in this game, it seemed like there was an attention to detail and this is what we want to do. So let's go out there and do it. Like, it felt like they had a game plan. They stuck to it. And we at least saw glimpses of what this offense could be. Um, I looked at that one drive to where it was 16 to seven. They scored the Friar Me touchdown to make it 23 mm-hmm. to seven. That drive right there had literally everything that you want to see. Like to me, that is the ceiling of what this offense could be. Uh, we saw play action. We saw them use motion on a passing play. We saw them blocking well out in space on that little Jalen Warren dump off. We saw them use the middle of the field. And then we saw a play action bootleg from Kenny with a wide open firing within the end zone to finish it off. So to me, I looked at this and was like, okay, from a play calling perspective, I don't know that it was much different from week one or week two, but from like an execution and game plan perspective, I think you got to tip your cap a little bit to what this offense was able to do. I think you do too. Um, I think they set up the play action perfectly, especially early on. Uh, Even if the run game wasn't going, they were still going to to be determined to run. (laughs) Yeah, There's people that are like, I don't get it because like the data, we have enough data at this point, like 10 years worth of it to show us that while it, yeah, if you can run the ball, the play action can be more effective, but you don't need to be able to run the ball to be able to run play action. Matt Canada said in a statement last week that that's why they don't use more play actions because they haven't been able to establish the run. Again, there's 10 years of data that shows us you don't necessarily need to be able to run the football to run play action. 
doesn't yeah, hurt. And but. well, I think they proved that on on Sunday night because it's not like they were lighting up the 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 no. uh, the sticks with the run game early on. I, I think that, but they they were able to show an identity to the Raiders defense, and it got them to open up that play action and that drive that you were talking about on that Pat Frymuth touchdown. This might be a little bit of exaggeration, but I think that might be the peak that we've seen so far of what the offense looks like under Kenny Pickett. I, I think that what you've I put seen that entire drive on X and basically said the same thing. I, I didn't say I just said in some time, but certainly of the Pickett Canada marriage. But I almost yeah. feel like since, you know, Ben, like going back to all of last season, Mitch or Kenny, I would go back to, you know, since Ben was here that we've seen a drive like that. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, like, I don't know, maybe it's tough because you did have you did have the drive against the Raiders last year that led to the George Pickett touchdown and then the yeah. Najee Harris touchdown late in the game. It was the, those two minute drills. Um, That's what the Alan said Ravens. outside of two minutes. It was their most impressive drive. Yeah, I, I, I just think you, you saw everything that you wanted to see and you topped it off with a touchdown to Pat Fryermuth, the one we wanted to get going into the game. So I'm happy mm -hmm. they got him a scored as well. Um, I, I, I definitely still think that there's there's individual play calls throughout the game that are going to happen that that you still question. But overall, I think the identity of the offense was pretty clear in, in what they were trying to do in this game. And I do think that there was a, a big improvement from what we saw definitely from week one to week two, but then from, from week two to week three, I didn't come away from this game still scratching my head about how are we going to operate offensively. I think you started to see more of an identity and you started to see a better Kenny Pickett play. I thought he, he was more accurate in this game. There's, there were still yeah. some of the, the pocket issues where he started to, to scramble from pressure that wasn't necessarily there yet. Um, I still think that he's missing uh, throws to not, not necessarily throws that he's making, but just not seeing guys that are open in, in some of his progressions. But overall, this is a more uh, comfortable conversation I'm having about Kenny Pickett that I don't have to worry about, or at least I'm not worrying about this week, where the accuracy was. Because that's something that we were always reliable with with Kenny Pickett. And we were questioning through the first two weeks, like, why are some of these throws behind guys in the dirt? It was something that we hadn't really seen from him, even going back to college. And so to be able to see him make that progression to to get to this point where yeah there's still some things he needs to work on but at least his arm looked good and I thought a lot of his passes looked good whenever he was making those so the offense left me um with a better taste in my mouth this week than definitely did after week one and week two um and it, it gives me more confidence moving forward that like what I said last week and why I predicted the Steelers to win this game I just feel like you're going to keep chipping away at it. It's not going to suddenly flip a switch and be perfect from one game to the next, but you're going to continue to see those progressions as the season moves along. Um, and I, I, I think that as you, you uh, get more confidence and not necessarily confidence, confidence was never an issue with Kenny, but when he figures out like, Oh, I don't need to escape the pocket right now. I can still sit in the pocket when I don't there's no pressure on me right right just a second. And when he gets better at those progressions, I think this this offense can actually be pretty decent and pretty and closer to what we thought it could be with the weapons that it has. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of things that I was questioning for the first two weeks, we got answers on. Like it, it just makes it all that much more odd the way that Kenny looked in week one and week two. Not saying that he's where you know, they need to be to be Super Bowl contenders or there's not more within there. I think that there's still obviously a ton of room for improvement, but he's about he looked about where you would expect him to. I feel like like it was where we expect Kenny Pickett to be. And he looked like a guy that you can win with like this Steelers team with the defense they have with a complement of, you know, skill players they have and everything like that. They don't necessarily they don't need him to be a world beater, but they need him to be what he was on Sunday night, what he was on Sunday night play action, 6 of 8, 61 yards, 4 first downs, 135.4 passer rating on play action. Again, you know, doing things like that are playing to his strengths. Um, I, I think that he looked obviously more accurate. I think the big thing, too, going back to, like, doing some things with a bootleg and stuff like that, he was making plays with his legs. I know he only had – he had that one really long run that got called back. He was like, all right, screw it, I'll do it again. Gets out again and play. runs for a first down <laughs> on the very next play. Um, using his legs, whether that was actually taking off or just extending some plays, 
I think that was something that had been missing through the first two weeks as well. So I thought he looked a lot more comfortable. It gives me a lot more reason for hope going forward for this offense, where they're going to be. Um, you look at what he did 10 plus yards down the field as well. Six for 10, 142 yards and two touchdowns on plays, 10 plus yards down the field. That's pretty solid. Again, you can, you can win with that. If this offense isn't going to be, you know, consistent enough to constantly be like nickel and diming down the field and then be really good in the red zone. They're going to need to find some explosive plays. They have two 70 plus yard touchdowns on the season, which is pretty crazy. Kenny actually has the two longest touchdown passes on the year by any quarterback. His oh, really? <laughs> Pickens in week two and his touchdown to Calvin Austin on Sunday night football this past week. That play to Calvin Austin, I think, came at the perfect time for this offense. That the Raiders had already scored in this one. The offense was kind of looking the exact same like it has through week one and week two. And then Kenny hits that big shot, which, by the way, man, Jalen Warren on that blitz pickup with that stunt. or I don't know if it was necessarily like a blitz. But that stunt from Crosby where he's looping around mm -hmm. towards the middle of the offensive line. He was about to come pretty clean on Kenny. That sounded terrible. Pause. He was about to get home on <laughs> Kenny. And Jalen Warren uh, picks him up and lets him rip one down the middle of the field. Calvin, this is the benefit of no longer being with a network, by the way. Um, rips it down to Calvin Austin for a long touchdown. My question to you is, and we're just going to keep going forward, and, and that's going to be a nice little nugget for people. Um, do you think Calvin Austin, even when Deontay Johnson comes back, has like a role within this mm -hmm. offense. I was asking Alan about this. We're not gonna, we're not sure we're going to see like four receivers, but could it maybe be more Calvin Austin than we expected and less Allen Robinson than we expected when Deontay Johnson comes back? I think it could because I, Calvin Austin does something that none of the other receivers do. Um, each of them have their own things that they're really good at. Like right, So Deontay, when he comes back, he's the best route runner of the team. He finds the open space easier than anybody um anybody on the Steelers George Pickens for example he's just kind of like the hybrid like perfect mold of what you would think of a wide receiver big outside guy that can just is, is a dog that can go up and grab it um but he's also good with route running too the the thing with Calvin Austin that that he has that the others don't have he can just take the top off a of defense and, and we saw that on that touchdown none of those guys have that breakaway speed to be able to just like Say I'm running a nine. I'm I'm just I'm just going free, and you're gonna throw the ball to me, and I'm going to go catch it. That's basically what he was doing. Um, so I do think that there's a a space in the offense, even when Deontay comes back, and even if they do continue to use Allen Robinson too, I I think Allen Robinson is still valuable to the team. Um, where you'd want to use all four of those guys, and I don't think it's gonna be as prominent of a role for Calvin Austin, but I do st still think that there's. Um, ways that they can utilize that speed because that is the main thing that he has where you're like, wow, that's something that no one else has when you watch him. No, none of our other years. players have that. So we, we're, we're probably talking about going back to, towards like maybe even like Mike Wallace if we're talking about just like flat out, I think, I'm running a straight line and you're going to throw it to me. I think Martavis had a little bit Martavis, of that to him. Yeah. Yeah. Like that explosive – if you put the ball in his hands at any moment, he could take it to the house. I think he was the last player on the roster like that. Very different in terms of the build of those two, but just like the explosive play creation. That play, thinking back on it, though, with Calvin Austin's hilarious. The Raiders are playing single high safety, shading towards George Pickens, and it's Marcus Peters one-on-one -on -one with Calvin. Marcus Peters has done some great things in this league. He ain't keeping up with Calvin Austin. Yeah. No, it, it, I don't think there's any a DB in the league that is going to be able to make that transition to to be able to not only be able to keep up with the guy, but to be able to even remain remotely close. I I I, I feel like there's such an advantage when you're a guy like Calvin Austin in that situation where you know you're running a go ball and the DB has to flip his like he has to flip his hips and immediately start running the other way. Otherwise, he's not coming up to you. If he's if he moves backwards, if he he if he like backpedals any time, you've already won because he's not going to be able to transition that well. I want to see when we play Cincy a rep where DJ Turner lines up against Calvin Austin. DJ Turner's like the one corner in the league that could probably step for step go with Calvin Austin. I, I would love to see him, but again, you're like, you can't be backpedaling though. Like he's going to have any corner in the lead is going to have to give cushion that to Calvin because you can't, 
you know, you, you, you can't let him get behind. He's going to get behind you if you're back. This is going to be a YouTube exclusive. You're going to have to be set up like this. <laughs> like, like, if you are a DB and you are playing in man, you're playing like a stance like man, where you're standing forward. You already lost. You're basically going to have to open up your stance and already be ready to just turn and go. Because if that's what's going to take to be able to keep up with him, otherwise he's just going to run straight past you. You're not going to be able to do it smooth enough that you can transition your hips like that. Like he did on Sunday night. Yeah. I'm uh yeah, I, I think that he has to be a part of this offense, even when Deontay Johnson comes back. It's going to be interesting to see, like, to the level that that is. But they can't – you need that explosive player, at like, somewhere within that offense and create touches for him. So, um, yeah, that will be interesting to see, too. The one thing that still I just – I can't figure out – I can't figure out why this run game is as bad as it is. Even like Najee had 65 yards in this game. He had 12 yards over expected. Najee Harris was was actually good, like good in this game, but it's not going to look like it because of how bad the offensive line was. Jalen Warren had negative yards above expected, so he wasn't good as a runner. He made his mark in the receiving game, which is typically going to be the case. But this offensive line, I just it's so hard to figure out. This should have been a game where you look at the Raiders outside of Max Crosby you know, not another household name on that defense. You would have thought, you know, with the guard duo that the Steelers have, I actually thought Samalo had, he looked more like the player that they thought they were bringing in free agency. He was the one guy I thought on the offensive line was okay, but man, I can't figure out why things are so bad right now with the run game. I don't know what it is either. Um, and man, you're preaching to the choir because I'm watching the Steelers who can't run the ball. As many of you listen to the show. I'm a huge BYU fan. They're averaging 2.5 yards per carry on the season. It's It's been abysmal watching my teams run the football this season. And it's hard for me to blame the running backs on either of my teams. It's it's hard mm. for me to really look at what um, Najee Harris or Jalen Warren are doing and really blame them for, for the woes of the run game. I think the only thing that you could say with like Najee or, or really any of the running backs for the, for the Steelers, um, I wish they would just like – make a decision and go. Sometimes I feel like they get caught up into, into I don't know where to go because there is nowhere to go. Um, and then they kind of, I don't know, say they necessarily lose yardage from that, but like they don't gain as much as they possibly could. But I feel like even if there's nowhere to go, just hit the hole as hard as you can. Um, Did you see, you remember the play on Sunday night where Najee broke five tackles, like literally threw somebody into the ground, broke five tackles to be able to lose four yards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that's what I mean. And well, that's, and that's what I'm saying with like the, the, the yards the, of expected. Another is like I I feel like not in just this game but like the the Cleveland and the San Francisco game it's not like they're always stacking the box too. I feel like they're not. And and the run game is still not operating to the best of its ability. And I feel like that yeah. starts with the the offensive line at that that case. If they're not stacking yeah. eight guys in the box and you can't run the football how am I not supposed to just instantly look to the line and say like, you you get no push. You're losing the battle in the trenches. And that's why you can't gain a yard. I mean, obviously Najee averaged 3.4 yards per carry in this game, but a lot of that was because of the fight after contact of what Najee was doing. Yeah. Um, I, I understand too. Something else I wanted to bring up that was so important to me. Like I was sitting in my basement. This is by the way, the first game since, they lost to the Broncos in 2018 that I watched in my basement because my niece and nephew were sleeping over. They obviously have school on Monday, so my dad and I had to watch in the basement. 1-0 down here. People are going to say I should probably just watch every game going forward down here. But um, what was I saying? Oh, I was literally like, please, please, please hit one of these corners with a double move, do play action, something, because these corners were cheating on every single play, knowing that the Steelers were just running curls and short outs and this short – passing game crap that they were just sitting on these routes and if somebody would have hit them with a double move or something they would have been running naked down the field and i kept waiting for it to happen everybody wants to bring back ben as an oc no we're not going to bring him back to be an oc we're not going to bring him back to be a quarterback's coach we're going to bring him back for one thing only we need you to teach kenny how to pump fake like you did 
and we're going to use these double moves to our advantage. That's how they're going to open up that pass game with the double moves. Kenny needs to learn. I don't know. Maybe he know, knows how to pump fake well. I, to be honest, I'm not I quite sure. Yeah, I, I don't know that I've ever I don't really seen see him do it. So yeah. they need, well, then again, I don't know. Small hands. Oh, no, they need, wait. They need was... some extra adhesive on that glove. I don't know. What game was it? It was towards the end of last season, I think. I don't know if it was that Raiders game on the touchdown to Pickens or if it was the Browns one with the touchdown to Pickens. But like his pump fake isn't like a isn't like with the ball. It's almost like a shoulder thing, mm -hmm. like the, like a shoulder torque. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. If, which one of those. I don't know if you need to kind of like tuck the tuck the ball against your forearm or do something. I know you got small hands. So we're gonna have to rub some extra adhesive on the glove. But yeah, we got to teach you how to pump fake and really utilize those double moves with the receivers. We're just, we're just I mean. We're just giving you options right now, okay? Yeah, we know Kenny uh, listens. I don't think he watches, but I think he listens pretty he listens. sure. So, yeah. Um, the last thing I want to give a cap tip to in this game: special teamers. Chris Boswell was awesome. Hit a fifty-seven yard in this game, and he looks healthy. You know, I think that that groin is completely healed from last season. But Presley Harvin, man, he had he's had two games in a row now. Where he's been really good. I think he had one punt in this game that wasn't very good. Immediately made up for it on his next time, which was the last punt of the game, where he gets like 10 seconds of hang time to take the clock down to 13 seconds. Smacks the dude in the helmet, muffs the punt, and the Steelers aren't able to recover. But then Jimmy G just throws a pick right to Levi Wallace anyway. But both those guys, man, the special teams unit, I think the Steelers throughout three games here have had, you know, really good performances from those guys. So... I think I give a, give a little bit of a cap tip to Danny Smith's unit as well. I do too, and I I gotta personally apologize to to Presley Harvin because I told you about last week where I was watching the game with my cousin online, and I was about to say, "Hey, this our punter sucks," and then he he nails one inside the five, and he does it back to back times last week. He did it like four, and then, and then, four times inside the ten last week. Yeah, and then this week he he averaged fifty three point something yards per punt. Uh, I, I, I gotta apologize. I, I, I sincerely apologize to you, Presley Harvin. Uh, I wasn't familiar with your game. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, the thing is too, it's not like, I mean, very much warranted the criticism for his performance. Oh, I know. So we're talking about, we're talking about a couple <laughs> games here. Hopefully it continues, but like, it's obviously never been a, like, if you get drafted as a punter, you're obviously talented enough to do it at this level. It's just like the head space. I mean, you won the Ray guy. Like, yeah, in college, so obviously he's good at punting, but mm -hmm. so much like and there's other positions in other sports that are like this. A lot of it is just mental, and punting and kicking is very much a mental game. Yeah. Um, speaking of games, real quick, obviously before we get out of here, we got to talk about next week's game: Houston Texans, one o'clock. JJ Watt will be going into the Houston Texans Ring of Honor. Um, for this one, which by the way has made the prices for that game skyrocket. The average Texans ticket, or not the average, the cheapest ones. You can normally go to a Texans game for like forty bucks. That game is between four hundred and five hundred for the cheapest ticket. So very much impacting that game. Um, that is the reason I'm not going. By the way, because that's in what I would consider drivable yeah. distance for me. Not going mm -hmm. because I'm not paying that. Yeah, and lucky for you, you will still be able to get to a Steelers game this year. So. Um, Steelers three point favorites right now going to Houston. Houston, I think, has looked a little bit better than people expect. I know they are just one and two on the season, but they've been in each of these games. They beat Jacksonville last week, um, which, by the way, that's a whole different thing. But Jacksonville does not look like the team a lot of people thought they would look like out of the gates here. Uh, CJ Stroud is really the surprise to me. And, uh, and that's coming from somebody that watched him at Ohio State and is a fan of him, certainly rooting for him to succeed, just not this upcoming week. Only Laramie Tunsil and oh well, no, uh, Shaq Mason as well. So they have two of their regular starters right now on the offensive line. Like that's not a great environment for a rookie quarterback. But CJ Stroud has come in there and just really looked like a guy that's beyond his years. Nico Collins is having a nice year. His connection with Tank Dell has been great. They are definitely getting the most out of that offense. That if you look on paper, really wouldn't move you. But the Texans are staying in some football games, and they look like they're kind of on the right track. Like it looks like C.J. Stroud's a guy. It looks like they got their coach in D'Amico Ryan's, and they got some pieces. Obviously, they're not there yet, but they've impressed me so far through three games. I'd say so too. I mean, considering how bad the Texans were uh, just a year ago, I, I think that um, C.J. Stroud has been one of the most uh, surprising parts to this rookie class so far. Not that I thought he was going to be bad. 
unnecessarily, but I just think that he's playing. I'd say him uh, or Bijan right now is rookie of the year. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would agree with that. I, I'd probably actually get, just give the tip to uh, to CJ Stroud, considering what you were just talking about with with what he was going against him with that offensive line um, and pl- the playing the position that he does. I think he's looked great so far. Um, he he's someone that I'm definitely rooting for just individually to to do well. Um, but I I think that the Texans are are going to be better than what um, some Steeler fans may think they are. I, I think that the Steelers are are still going to win this game though. Um, it, it, when we come to predictions, but I, I think that the Texans are going to to test some things for the Steelers. Um, I don't think the defense is is going to be a slouch for the, for the Steelers' offense. I think that if the Steelers' offense perfor- offense performs well this upcoming week, I still think that'll that'll look good because I think that the Texans' defense um, they've got some dudes on there. Um, so I, I I think that. That's something to look forward to to see if the Steelers' offense can t- continue to make another um, step forward against another solid defense uh, overall. I think defensively, the Steelers should have their way with that offensive line. I don't expect you know Damian Pierce to have a good day on the ground. TJ Watt going against the backup right tackle again because Titus Howard is not going to be healthy. He's this is the last game he has to miss, being that he started the season on IR. Um, so he's going to face George Fant, who's, you know, kind of a journeyman right tackle. I would expect TJ has his way. And then in the interior, old friend Kendrick Green will be starting for sure at that right guard spot. So, you know, Keanu Benton could be in line for a nice day after he really had a nice day, I thought, on Sunday night. Got his first career sack with a great uh, club swim move. Um, and then looking at the Texas defense, their two best players are probably their safety duo, uh, Jimmy Ward and Jalen Petrie, who's a really nice young safety. Just you know, Stingley is going to be out. They placed, I think they placed him on IR. If they didn't, he's for sure missing multiple weeks with a hamstring injury. Um, Will Anderson, obviously, you know, they took him number three overall. They expect him to be a, a franchise player for them, but you know, he's a rookie, like he's not there yet. You know, I, I'm sure that he's had flashes. I haven't watched a ton of them, but just on the surface. Doesn't look like he's been like super impactful for them yet. Um, 13 total tackles. He has one sack, uh, just one hurry quarterback hurry. So, yeah, I mean, he's not doing a whole ton as of this point. Um, and there's just like, I think what makes their defense as good as it is or as good as it's been, like kind of overperforming, isn't necessarily the personnel. D'Amico Ryan's coming from San Fran, I think is really, mm-hmm. you know, that the defensive mind that he is kind of, I'll, I'll say the same thing about their offense. Bobby Slowick, who was of the Shanahan tree as well, came over from San Fran with D'Amico. I think he's got those guys overperforming. I'll say the same thing about the defense. I think D'Amico is kind of overperforming given, given the talent that he has. Again, I do like some of the guys on the back end of that defense. I just, I, I have a hard time envisioning with, you know, the Steelers, skill position players that they have that the Texans can match them across the board. So it'll be interesting to see, but um, prediction wise, you said you think the Steelers win. Where are you at with it though? I have an absolute stinker of a score. This is this score. This score is smelly. This score is ugly. 25 to 16 Steelers. We're still going to win, but just the absolute numbers of it. Don't ask me how they're getting to the score. Dommy. Don't ask me how they're getting to those numbers. I have no answer yeah. for you, but 25 to 16. I just feel like this game, the Steelers are going to win. I feel like it's going to be comfortable, but I feel like the score is just going to be like, Ugh, why is I don't like those numbers in that order. I'm going to make a prediction right now. The Steelers are going to do it. They're going to hit 30. Oh, wow. I think the Steelers wow. offense, and that's without a defensive touchdown. Well, here's a, here's another question for you. They, they're going to hit 30, but are they going to break 400 offensive yards Mm. see the tough thing about that is i don't know that it's an offense designed to do that like they're just like a slower moving like pick up third downs again they've gotten some explosive chunk plays this year with 270 yard touchdowns but that's like those are outliers to me i don't expect that to happen with any consistency um I'm going to say no. I think they're going to be, they're going to win the field position battle. I think they're going to have some shorter fields in this one. And that's really what it's about. Um, But yeah, I think they put up 30. I think the Texans, again, I think that they've kind of been overachieving from where I expect them to be. I'm not saying that they're just like going to completely fall off in this game, but I'm going to do 30 20 Steelers. I love it. 
I love it. And I mentioned to you that to close out this this show, and yeah. this, we're going to do this every Steelers show from from now until at least the end of the season. We're going to have a little segment to close out the show, just going to be like a couple minutes long. And it's gonna, we're going to call it the Smitty Steelers Sound Off. We're going to round out the show with this. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. You're not going to know them ahead of time. And I, mean, I didn't even know this was a thing ahead of time. They're just so. going to be a little like <laughs> like bang bang bang, like not really a, a ton of thought into them, and they're they're going to be geared okay. around the Steelers, but they're going to be some fun ones in it too. Okay, number one, do you think you could get a single yard behind the Steelers' offensive line as no. it is right now? No, I don't think I could get negative two yards behind the Steelers' offensive line right now. So you're thinking you're going like negative fifteen? Yeah, if that. yeah if. Like yeah, you're getting get, tackled in the backfield. Every if I have time. if I have five carries, it's going to be negative fifteen yards. Okay, I I agree with that actually. Not because I doubt you, but I, I just doubt, feel I like. Doubt me. I mean, I I do doubt you in that situation, <laughs> but not in life. Second, Calvin Austin. We just talked. We just talked about his speed a lot. If you're in a 100 meter dash, but you get a 50 meter head start, do you think you could win? And if not, how far of a head start in the 100-meter dash do you think you would need in order to beat Calvin Austin? At least 75, if not 80. I mean, not only am I probably going to need my inhaler at least once <laughs> in that duration, I can't imagine my body holding up. Like, I, I honestly, For I... 25 I'm, meters? <laughs> I... Yeah, Try, like knowing that I'm trying to beat a professional athlete in a race, the you know the stress that I'm putting on my body for those 25 meters. <laughs> no, I I, I, yeah. I think that's funny. Not I close. think that's funny. Not close. Hey, uh, Calvin Austin doesn't know about your knee surgery though. Your knees are good to go now. So my knee, my knee, my knees are good to go. What's weird is like I don't know if I'm overcompensating for it, but every time that I like walk somewhat of a day, like even so, just to walk back after like a Steelers game from the stadium to the rivers. My ankles and feet will be killing me just from that walk. Just getting old, man. All right. Lastly, last thing. Are the Steelers the best road fan base when it comes to traveling to away games in the NFL? Yes. I I am I'm always more impressed by what they do at away games than the fan base that shows up at home games. I think that they have a more loyal strong fan base outside of Pittsburgh than they do within Pittsburgh. I I unfortunately agree with that. I think that the the fan base in Pittsburgh is getting a little too old. And I, maybe that's just the I, just, I think they take them for granted. You know, I think it's like I think there's almost like a spoiled um a, a, a sense of being spoiled here. I don't know what it is. Like I I think the home games almost have like a corporate feel to them a lot of the times now. Yeah. Um where it's like, you know, I say the same thing about the Penguins. I think that a lot of companies are who have their hands on season tickets and they're just like a um, they're an asset for the company to be able to give to people, you know, clients and stuff like that. I don't know that a, a ton of people there. There's certainly a ton of passionate fans, but I think that there's a good people that are there on Sundays now that aren't necessarily the most passionate fans that just have access to tickets. Yeah. For sure. I mean, there's people like you that are going to go, you're a diehard fan and and you're going to lose your mind. But at the same time, there's some people that are going to go and they're just going to kind of gonna go just to go and, and kind of uh, go to enjoy the game, not just because they're get their, passionate get their Instagram the picture off, but, you know, but it, but it, but, you know, if you're at an away game, then I expect that you are the type of Steeler fan that is just very passionate and, and is making that much of an effort to go into an away stadium. By the if way, Allegiant spending... Stadium. It's a top-notch stadium. I've been there twice, neither for an NFL game, but I do actually think yeah. it's a really nice stadium. I would love to go sometime. I mean, this would have been a great opportunity, obviously, but, man, I don't. I think it would make more sense to do it for something that's not an NFL game, or at least not the Steelers, like maybe on like a some year where the Steelers have a bye week or they play on a Thursday or Monday night and see the Raiders play somebody else just to be able to go to that stadium. Alan was telling me about it, too. I don't know if you would agree with this, but he says it's not like vegas -y, but it's like perfect for the Raiders. Like it just fits the team more than it does the city. It's not vegas -y. I mean, it is It is very much a a slab of concrete. Like the concourses Death are Star. slabs of concrete. Um, 
uh, yeah, it, it it is. It's it's very much like dull on the inside, I'd say. But like, mm. I think the seats are pretty comfortable. I think that it's it's nice and it's it's Important. wide open on the inside. It's clean, um, and I grow up to obviously it's new, so it's going to be like that. But I do think that it's a nice stadium. The most Vegasy thing about it is for some reason they have a big torch facing the strip. Oh yeah, something mm-hmm. like that. And there is like a club in there as well that they really haven't highlighted yeah. i feel like since the first year that it was open but um and then of course there's like a ton of celebrities that are always going to be there too so that aspect yeah. of it sure but in terms of the building itself it doesn't feel like you're in vegas like you're yeah. the closest casino to you is mandalay bay like a, a couple blocks away but you don't mm-hmm. feel like you are in the strip of vegas like you just you feel like you were at a football game yeah that's dope um but all right, there you go. So we both have the Steelers beating the Texans to go to three and one, which I think is super important. Like I, I, I feel like they have to win this one. You get the Ravens coming to Pittsburgh the following week, and then you get the bye. So if you can win this one, and it's sure that at worst you're going into the bye three and two, and then you should have some reinforcements on the way in the form of Deontay Johnson, and then you know Cam Hayward probably a couple weeks after that, you're setting yourself up more like after losing that that opener thirty to seven, you're in a much better position. If you can, you know, do that. So, um, all right. I think that does it. Unless you got anything else. Good episode. Really good talk here. Let us know what you guys think about Steelers Texans on Sunday. Let us know how you feel about anything that we talked about. Are you in a good spot? Are you in a better spot right now with the offense than you were after that week two win? Uh, is TJ Watt the best version of TJ Watt right now? Let us know how you feel about that as well in the comments down below. Um, as Tyler mentioned at the beginning of the show, rocking around the 412 year six, well underway at this point as we approach October. So get involved. We've raised $25,000 in the first five years of doing so, going to kids in the 724 and 412 area codes. Every penny that is donated goes directly to providing Christmases like Tyler and I were fortunate enough to have growing up, never had to worry about where Christmas was coming from. That's the goal. That's the mission for us, as always. Uh, along with that, last year we partnered up with the East Rochester Salvation Army. They do their Angel Tree program at Christmas time. In the name of our late friend Dalton Keene, we've been able to get involved with that and want to keep that going as well. So the link to that is in the description. Get involved. You'll win. Uh, you'll have the chance to win some really cool prizes down the line as well. I haven't purchased any of them yet. When I do, I'll you know what is it called? Is it is it just post now for X? Yeah, at least I'll post. post. Yeah, so we'll post about it. Yeah, Yeah, we'll post about it on our X account uh, when we start getting the prizes in and stuff. But what you can expect jerseys, some signed memorabilia, whether that's like pirates wise, it will be like bats or maybe some pucks or footballs, whatever, mini helmets. I don't know. A lot of the stuff from like TSE or Pristina Auction, that type of stuff. So get involved and then check out. We mentioned at the beginning as well. You, can, you know, you can match Bonnie Weeks if you want to get one of uh, Haley Wagner's everything custom designs. Pittsburgh shirt. She just came out with a new design as well. She has a lot. She has like an entire line for like Steeler stuff. So you can go and check that out as well. If you want to get a custom trick or treat bag for your children, that you can find those there as well. If you want a hat, you can't. So no, you can't do that. <laughs> Sorry. But anything else? Not anything else. A lot of other things. Everything custom designs. Haley Wagner. Check that out. Um, but other than that, for Tyler, for Smitty, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Leave us a five-star review. Go watch one of the other videos that's popping up right now, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>